I have the great pleasure of uh, starting the day at 8.30. I think Elena has given me this slot on, just on purpose that I wake up everybody. Thank you, Elena. Uh, I'm going to be sharing this morning a couple of my views about where the aerospace industry is going and where specifically the training and the virtual industry is also going there. But before I start, my friends in communication at CA have prepared just a couple of slides on the company. So, you know, who is CA? CA, world leader in delivering, we're a training company, world leader in delivering training, virtual training in civil defense and security, and recently for the last six years in healthcare as well. To summarize the company, 30 minutes video there, by the way. 30 minutes, 30 seconds, apologies, <laughs> video of who we are.
the day somebody takes, he has the idea, I'm going to travel today. You know, up to the point where he purchases a ticket, he goes to the airport, boards the aircraft, and is carried to its end destination satisfactorily. That, that's what the marketing people are calling the customer experience there. The digital twin, they exist in all of those worlds. And, and, and you can see on the right side of the chart there, where the, the optimization and the new technologies are taking those digital representations there. If you, if you go back to the beginning, the day the aircraft were designed and manufactured, people are not talking about smart factories. You know, the Germans have uh, coined this industry 4.0 there. If you look into the operational life optimization and maintenance there, you know, in, 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 we're all talking about connected object, internet of things there. It started about four years ago with people were calling this machine, machine to machine communication or machine internet there. And now we call this internet of things there. Now if you look about the, the third element there, the operational sector, what we're observing now is internal search motors. The, the Google of your internal company. You, know, you, can, you, know, you can all go to Google and click and Google is a search motor that will crawl the web and give you addressable, uh, addressable information there. But those, those search engines that exist in a company and they've been designed to break down the silos of traditional IT systems to link them together easily without even rewriting uh, all of them there. And at the end there, talk about the uh, customer experience. Uh, what, what, we're, uh, what the marketing, the modern marketing people are talking about now is predictive customer behavior technology there. It, it's no secret that every company is moving towards fidelity program and they try to map your purchases and your, your, your consumption profile and they try to map your own profile to try to predict where you're going to spend your next dollar there. So this is what's happening in the aerospace world today. There. I mean, the... the, the uh, the American analysts, the American industry analysts there are, are looking at the situation and they're certainly looking for, for the developed aerospace economy there. The conclusion is the value creation from the digital synthetic world is overtaking the traditional industry sector. There, there will be more money created, more economic activity created into the digital synthetic world. That, that's their conclusion. And they even coined it with a pretty dramatic uh, term there. It sounds like a science fiction movie there, but it, they call that a swap from carbon to silicon. That, that's how they coin it there, the transformation of the economy. You know, I've been 30 years in the economy, I've been 30 years in aerospace. I have lived the transformation from aluminum to carbon fiber. I've lived the transformation from you know, drafting boards with pens and paper to 3D CATIA. And now we're into the transformation. The aerospace industry is living the transformation to silicon, to digital technology. Back to training, you know, back to our industry closer right there. A bit looking into the past, in, into the mid, mid 80s, aviation went from live training to virtual training. We were training pilots before the 80s, pilots were being trained on the actual aircraft. A very inefficient process, a costly process. Full flight simulators were introduced with a qualification in the standard label into the 80s there where the bulk of the training was transmitted, transferred from the aircraft to the flight simulator. A bit later in the 90s there, we started to uh, link constructive content to virtual content. Constructive content gives you a, a sort of a global context into your virtual environment. The synthetic environment of virtual training became rich and dense and you can interact and it increases your training experience. I mean, at this example, this is a, an aircraft, uh, it's an airport terminal there, which is completely populated with a constructive entity there, adding to the richness of your training experience. So when you land at the airport, you, you, you have the complete feeling that you're in a live airport. You're not in a nuclear devastated zone where there's no aircraft. You can even interact to some degree with those constructive entities there. But that's one of the examples of constructive. There, there's other applications, but that was one of the popular examples there. Where we are now, what's happening now, it's called connecting the live world to the virtual and constructive world there. Live, live aircraft, live vehicle, live entity being connected to a completely synthetic world and a completely constructive world there. And why? Why, why are the industries going this? There's a tremendous trust for 
joint joint operational mission training. You know, you're not only training how to operate your machinery, but you're being trained how to operate with your mission in a given context of conflict there. So what we're observing now is live aircraft being connected to simulated aircraft and to constructive sim uh, simulated scenarios. So you get examples of people on the ground in their operational unit operating in a tactical scenario being hooked up to another constructive entity equivalent in a different countries with the benefit of synthetic air covers coverage there interacting with other entities there. That's the most modern, this is a NATO chart there, it's the most modern joint training military is, is after. Many technologies of uh, now appearing to support this. This is what's happening now. Now, if we look back a bit and take a bigger, bigger view of the complete industry, there, uh, there's a guy called Alan, Alec Ross. There, and for a couple of years, he was a he was a senior advisor to uh, Hillary Clinton when she was serving as uh, Secretary of State. There, he was a technology and innovation advisor. There. He wrote the book. He wrote the book four years ago. Pretty interesting perspective there. You look on the uh, left side of the chart there and you see in blue the fundamental technology. And four years ago those fundamental technology were there and it, when you see uh, moving to green there were the emerging technology. If, if you look 3D printing today is pretty much a technology which is not emerging but it's there, internet the thing is there. there. So you can see those technology coming to the apex there and on the right side there you can see smart future scenarios, future business scenarios they are coming. The guy predicted uh, precision agriculture, uh, which was a result of internet geopositioning and mobility. He predicted this there. And in the middle of the chart, you see the societal tension resistance point, where the technology and the societal resistance will yield whether the future scenario will emerge or not. Let me consult my note before I move to the other chart. Yeah. I mean, it's fairly interesting uh, perspective about the future, what, what, what's happening and where we're going. It was only written four years ago. I, I, out of this there, I've extracted, you know, what I consider which are the eight technology which are going to bring aerospace in the short term to a tipping point there, something that will change. The first two, single open architecture and single one world terrain started standard are very much in our industry, in the simulation training industry there. They're, they are addressing a challenge that we have for a long, long time is connecting all those synthetic worlds together, coming from different proprietary company. Just to draw a parallel with the, the real world, is, is try it like you play a video game on the web, like Assassin's Creed, and you try to enter another video game which has been written by a competing company there. A, quite of a challenge today, but this is where the simulation industry is today. Different companies write synthetic engines, simulation engines, and the end customer wants to interoperate those different worlds together there. There's been quite of a progress along that where interfaces are being exposed and agreement on a single terrain standard. The external world is coming together there. The other technology are coming, what's called point of need delivery, which is essentially the Google map on the uh, best example is a Google map on your smartphone. If you think about it, there, you know, into the Google Cloud, there, there's a geo representation of the complete earth running on the farms or servers there. And no matter where you are, with no matter which mobile device, you can consume that data in a format which is suitable for your, you know, for your personal uh, smartphone. That technology is called point-of-need delivery there. It's adapting the amount of content you stream over the web to the end application, to the capability of the end application. And if it's only a smartphone, I will display and I will render just enough information for that end application to be able to consume it satisfactorily. On the other end, if I got a pharma computer on the other side there, which is demanding a lot bigger content, it can process it there, I will stream bigger content and adapt to it. The other two technologies called Internet of Things sensors and big data analytics link together. I mean, if uh, I've said it earlier, a couple of years ago, only big assets like power plants and oil drilling factory had the luxury and the financial means to be hooked up to the internet and leak their data. Today, I can go to Home Depot and buy a Samsung washing machine there, and that Samsung washing machine 
hooks itself immediately to the web, connects itself to Amazon, and will order soap for me before me knowing it there. This is the standard of technology which is affecting the consumer goods today here. Big data analytics, it used to be sort of the sort of the, the dream of the big IT companies there, and it, it was perceived as a huge goal and a, a huge barrier to, to reach there. There's been a significant consolidation. A couple of players are emerging, like uh, the Microsoft Azure platform or the Amazon Web Service are emerging with an incredibly easy and affordable usability capability. So you, you can no, you, now you can not only focus, you don't need to focus on writing layers of IT software, you can focus onto your end business intelligent analytics. You don't need to deal with the complexity of the IT system. Artificial intelligence, best example of this is uh, what's happening with Siri and Cortana. Cortana with Microsoft, you talk to your computer, you ask a question, and it pops the answer to you. Same thing with Siri on the Apple there. This is the dawn, the beginning of a phenomenon where you will have significant artificial intelligence being built and assisting you behind the scene there. Automatic, automated intelligent tutors there, fed by uh, artificial intelligence is a phenomenon we're happening there. And some of the application, tutorial application, education application, you get somebody helping you in the back there. That technology has come from the video game essentially. Video game where you know you, you start to play and you're stuck into a bed in a dungeon and you don't know how to get out. You know, the, the video game company will help you automatically. They're going to prompt a few cues indicating you which is the way out of the dungeon. And, and the last one, augmented reality. Uh, the Consumer Electronics Show this year, 2000, January 2016, the floor space and the number of exposants about augmented reality is. Uh, increased by 80% with respect to last year. There's a tremendous trust from the gaming industry behind the rise of that technology. Two major players are emerging, you know, the Oculus Rift, which is completely virtual reality, and more recently, the, uh, the uh, HoloLens from Microsoft, which is a, a very serious augmented reality proposal uh, uh, class set there. So these are the digital uh, technologies that I consider are gonna take the aerospace to a tipping point there. Already we see concrete application of this. And CAE there, large scale simulation, a naval training simulation for a ship with all the battle stations that you got inside the ship from the engine room, the sonar, the radar, the gun operator, the electronic communication. About 60 stations there, all linked to a very complicated naval scenario with threats and friends under the water, above the water and into the air on land, all mixed into what I call a hybrid a conflict zone with civilian traffic, air traffic, navigating on top of you there. So this is one of the first outcome of those technology which is appearing now and it's going to disturb the naval training world. Another application, uh, refueling, air-to-air -air refueling. Uh, it's been a challenge for the uh, training industry for many years. Cost of training air-to-air -air refueling very significant because you need to mobilize not only the tanker, the crew of the tanker, but the, the, the fighters as well. Uh, the, around $20,000 to, to conduct a three-hour refueling mission there, as opposed to a simulator there. Uh, what has enabled this? There a lot of 3D rendering technology into the visual scene where you can see the boom approaching. So not only in the distance you see the fire aircraft, you get all the optics of the fire aircraft in your visual system, but you see the near object of the refueling boom, boom coming close to your aircraft there. We now conduct this where the tanker is located in one part of the country and the fighter is located in another part of the country and they're all both linked electronically together. One of my favorites uh, this year at the ITSEC show in Orlando, the aeromedical trainer there. This is a simulator, is the back end of a C-130 which has been configured in a medical evacuation mission there with all the stations for the wounded, either the wounded soldiers or the civilians there. It contains six stations there, it's on motion, it's linked to a flight profile with the motion and the vibration coming from the uh, C-130 and the noise, the deafening noise coming from those engines into that back-end cabin. 
and the medical uh, personnel is being trained into this complicated environment, both of sound, motion, and all of the uh, wounded people being represented by medical uh, patient simulator. Very, very innovative uh, solution for, for this type of mission. You know. Which brings me to the uh, last subject of uh, the presentation, uh, innovation, which is the key theme of this forum, innovation there. A couple of years ago, I think uh, 2004, uh, Franz Johansson wrote this book. It's called The Medici Effect. There. It's all about innovation. Just a bit of history, the Medici is uh, paraphrasing the Medici Italian family, which has been dominating the financial sector of the Southern Europe but it's also credited with the Renaissance, the European Renaissance in Europe there, which has taken Europe out of the Middle Ages to the Renaissance there. And how did they did this? Is they brought together in Italy, in the city of Florence, people from sectors that you would never thought would collaborate and work together. They brought bankers with artists, sculptors. I mean, the, my friend there, the president with Italian background, acknowledged. They're artists, musicians, architects, and it led to the transformation of Europe, to the, the whole movement called the Renaissance there. So what Franz Johansson argues there is the biggest amount of innovation will come when you intersect silos of activities which normally don't contribute and collaborate between themselves. This is where you intersect those ideas there and the biggest amount of innovation, new ideas will come out there. And there's a little funny illustration in his book there to illustrate the concept there. Well, he draws a parallel in music there at the top there's rock music with a, a band from the 70s called Kiss there and the bottom there's a, a classic music quatuor there and he draws the you know sort of a delamination of uh, the structure the instrument the voices there with a number of combination and rock music when you combine instrument structure and voices and uh, you do that individually it gives you 2004 Four, 400 combination. The same thing for classic music, but a very different mix there. When you combine those two, a bit like U2 and uh, Luciano Pavarotti, you came with six million combination there at this intersection of things which normally are not meant to work together. There. Which brings me to the conclusion of the slide there. New innovation in aerospace will come from collaboration and intersection with other industries. I've given you a couple of examples that we had at CAE, intersecting medical with aerospace, which has led to you know, stuff that never existed before there. Well, what I believe here in Canada and Montreal there is we got a couple of sectors which are fairly unique there, right in the city there. A medical expertise with six simulation training center into this city there, with two major hospitals, research hospital. A digital industry there which unsuspected capability in the big data. People are not aware of the capability that exists into the city about the academy capability into the big data uh, uh, capability. Uh, a gaming industry, you know, uh, worldwide recognized in Montreal uh, with uh, giants like Ubisoft, and thousands of engineers doing video gaming there. And a new phenomenon called the MOOCs Massive open, open, massive online open courses, essentially. Uh, it's coming out of the industry. Uh, I got two. I personally got two kids which are graduating university now, and it's very different. Uh, let me tell you, when I went to university uh, 35 years ago, there, you know, they, they can they can view all their material online. They can watch a YouTube video of their professor. They can rewatch it. They can collaborate globally when they write an, uh, an assignment there, and it's a group assignment. They, they never meet in the person. They meet on Google Doc, and they work in the same document live, and they comment the, you know, the work of each other. So th that type of learning, shared experience is coming from that, that sort of new technology there, and that new culture from those kids there. I, I believe you know, that unique combination is going to step us into new innovation uh, in aerospace. That was uh, the end of my conclusion. I think I did uh, well within time. I hope you've enjoyed my views. If, uh, as a summary, if you can, uh, you know, just walk out of this room with one thing, you know, I, I believe that we're at a tipping, tipping point in aerospace. There, those new technology have changed the value, the value creation scheme there, and I believe that we need to stay ahead of the curve. We need to do something 
with all that capability which is just around us. Thank you very much.